um, formative assessment results, district benchmark results, all those people. Uh, from the zero point or the origin down at the bottom there uh, with none of our students doing well up through the top of the vertical axis or y-axis, 100% uh, of our students are proficient or better on whatever measures we've got. This is the degree to which we're, we're being successful. Now, what's important, folks, is that if we're really going to do data right, we have to pay as much attention to the actions of the adults as we do to the results that we get from our kids. And that's your horizontal or x-axis on your screen labeled antecedents or cause data. Uh, the best school systems with which we work are those that link what they do with what they get. And really important, folks, this is not a gotcha. If you're taking notes as we go through here, and if you come back later and download the recording that I started late, uh, what's important to realize that accountability is absolutely not an exercise in, in gotcha or firing people because they're not getting the results that, that we want. It's about explicitly linking what we do with what we get so that we can learn from our mistakes. If you look at the lower right-hand quadrant there, it's labeled the learning quadrant. Um, in this quadrant here, you know, we're measuring, we're monitoring our specific actions, say the degree to which we provide students with feedback, uh, and we're linking that with student achievement results in the form of some of the assessments that you all have listed in the chat feature. Uh, if we see that our students are not improving on those formative assessment results, nobody's in trouble. It becomes a question of how do we need to provide feedback differently, do this more effectively, so that we can learn from what's not working and get to our desired quadrant or the leading quadrant up there uh, that you see in the upper right-hand side. And this is where we know exactly what we're doing and the impact that it's having on student achievement. In order to do that, again, folks, can't stress enough, we've got to pay as much or more attention to what our teachers, our principals, our system superintendents and directors of schools are doing. Now, does this work? When we do that, does that have an impact on student achievement? Uh, many of you may be familiar with the work of John Hattie. Uh, the book that I'm citing here is uh, Visible Learning. Uh, literally a synthesis of more than 800 meta-analyses in student achievement. Uh, and his more recent publication just released last year, Visible Learning for Teachers. One of the things that John Hattie does for us is, is really establish kind of a benchmark or a hinge point against which we can measure the impact of our practices. So he describes a barometer, which you see on your screen. Uh, there's a zero point, and, and you notice there's a, a wedge of this barometer that's colored green. There are actually some things that we can do in schools that have a negative or reverse effect on student achievement. Uh, one of those, for example, is retention. Uh, it has a, a negative effect size of 0.4. I'm sorry, negative 0.2. Uh, the blue, light blue wedge you see labeled developmental effects from zero up to about 0.2. This is how much kids will grow in a given year, just by getting older, having more experiences, um, going to school and just participating in, in what's going on there. So just through sheer development, uh, we'll have an effect size between 0 and 0.2. From 0.2 to 0.4, when John Hattie synopsized, uh, synthesized all of the research that he did, and folks, again, uh, the, the volume of research represented is just absolutely staggering. Literally tens of millions of students in the database and, and student assessment scores. What Hattie found was that the average impact or the typical teacher impact was up to about 0.4, an effect size of 0.4. So you see that circled in red there. What Hattie also found was that between 95 and 98 percent of what teachers do works. So it, it does actually improve student achievement. So when you or your colleagues will say, hey, what I do works, we're absolutely right. But John Hattie throws down a gauntlet to us. What he says is that we need to stop asking what works and start asking what works best. And so he's identified this hinge point or point four uh, in terms of an effect size as kind of the starting point. 
and we should be selecting only those practices that have an impact of greater than 0.4. So, folks, if you want to think about this in terms of years of achievement, a hinge point or the effect size of 0.4 is equal to one year of academic growth. So we want to do more than that. And many of the folks that I see signing on here today, like uh, my friends from Frederick County that I see online and from Connecticut uh, and other school systems uh, across the country, are serving students that have more than one year of academic gaps or deficits. And so if what we do is get one year of growth in every year that we do, we'll never close those gaps. So we need to shoot for what Hattie describes as that zone of desired effect beyond the point four. Now again, folks, the reason I'm dwelling on this, what we're talking about here with this data teams process or data done right is what John Hattie describes as formative evaluation. Now this is not evaluation of teachers by principals. Uh, this is not evaluation of students by teachers. What this is is evaluation of teachers by themselves in the form of the assessment results that they get from their students. So we give a formative assessment to our kids. We use that to measure the effectiveness of our instruction. We monitor and, and uh, adjust our instruction uh, based on the results of these assessments uh, and change that instruction as necessary uh, to ensure that we get the results that we want from our kids. When we do that, folks, we get an effect size of 0.9. Now, remember what I said just previously. An effect size of 0.4 means one year of growth. 0.9, then, folks, is literally two years or better in growth for our students. And so if we're going to close gaps, this is a very powerful way to go about doing that. Let me give you just a minute here, folks, before I move on. I want to see if there's any questions about uh, the research that I'm sharing with you from John Hattie. Uh, if you'll send those questions in via chat, that would be terrific. Give a minute or two to send those questions in. So folks, that brings us to data teams. Uh, and, and where does this fit in terms of doing data well? Two questions for you there on the screen. If again you would take the time, uh, please uh, send your uh, responses to everyone so that we can see those. If you'll take a, a minute or two and respond to those questions that you see there on the screen, that would be terrific. A uh, question from James. What types of assessment effectively measure instruction? Uh, it, James, it's, it's really a, a variety of assessments. They're formative assessments. They are uh, district benchmark assessments, teacher-designed uh, assessments in, in the form of exit slips or tasks that kids are asked to uh, do during the day. Uh, up to and including uh, our state-level assessments, all of those things can actually measure the effectiveness of our instruction. But what's important, if you all will think back to the uh, leadership and learning matrix, uh, it's critical that we monitor the instructional practice as closely as we monitor the results. Uh, so a couple of responses that you all see rolling in there, folks. In terms of how uh, folks meet, collaborate, uh, a couple of them are coming in privately, so I'll read those out to everybody. Uh, data teams, although we don't measure the collaboration. Uh, another here, we meet once every two weeks during administrative planning times, allotted for each content area. Uh, you see professional learning communities, common planning time. Okay, keep those responses coming in, folks, using that chat feature.
Again, you see the responses coming in, folks. Uh, yeah, the struggles, Elizabeth, uh, hitting some of the struggles that folks have with data teams there, folks. Uh, you know, who's responsible for what? Uh, data collection and sharing. We've got to clearly identify the role in order to be successful. All right. Uh, data teams meeting bi weekly, looking at the results of the assessments in order to measure the effectiveness of the instruction. Uh, PLC meetings being held in most buildings, not far enough along to develop good measures of the impact. All absolutely correct, folks. Uh, right on target. Now, what we need to start thinking about, folks, are, are data teams really at three levels. If we're going to measure the impact of our collaboration, certainly we need what we call the instructional data teams uh, to be collaborating on a regular basis around many of the assessments that you all have described so far. What we also need, though, folks, and that what many uh, schools and school systems are, are currently lacking or in the early stages of developing is what we describe as a building data team. Uh, and above that, then, a district data team or several district data teams. Now, I'm going to focus first on the instructional data team process because that's the most common, but as we go through each piece here, we'll relate the uh, other two levels to what we're talking about. Uh, what we mean, folks, by an instructional data team, and, and honestly, we don't care if you call it a professional learning community, a, a study team, or a grade level team, or Algebra 1 high school team. It doesn't matter what you call it. Uh, but what we're defining here, as you see on the screen, is a small grade level uh, or departmental course-like team that examines some sort of data or work from uh, a common formative assessment. A uh, question from John, uh, what exactly is meant by low results in the, in the accountability matrix? Uh, does that mean to reach the projected goal, not necessarily the goal that you have set? Uh, John, I'm not sure I'm, I'm following the question, so maybe uh, if you could send me a little more information there or give me a call, I'd be glad to talk about that after the webinar. Send me an email. I'm not sure that I know enough to, uh, about what you're asking there to respond to it. Um, now, folks, this is the instructional data team, but a building level data team, I don't have a definition on your screen for you, but a building level data team would consist of the uh, principal, assistant principal, other administrators, uh, the instructional specialists or support personnel if they're present in the building, and grade level representatives of the instructional data teams. So this is a, a little different take on your traditional school improvement team. Uh, maybe a little broader representation that many of the school improvement teams have uh, in the past have. Uh, you see that the instructional data team should be looking at common formative assessment results and thinking about how they teach and what they're going to use in terms of instructional practices. Uh, the building level data team should pay attention to two things, folks. They should pay attention to the functionality of the instructional data teams in the building and the quality of instruction. Both of those should be compared to our progress towards our student achievement goals that we've established in our school improvement plan. A district level data team uh, would similarly pay attention to the quality of instruction in the district as a whole and the effectiveness of uh, teacher collaboration and leadership collaboration around data. So where a building data team is going to provide feedback to instructional data teams, a district data team is going to monitor the effectiveness of both the instructional data teams as well as the building level data teams and provide supports as necessary. What's important, folks, is regardless of level, and again, you see a definition here on the screen for instructional data teams, there's a common, clearly defined focus. Uh, the instructional data teams share a standard in common to have a, an assessment that they've all administered. And folks, I want to talk for a little bit about those assessments. Don't overcomplicate them. There is no perfect assessment. So please don't wait until you design, design uh, what you feel to be a really great assessment before you begin this work. Uh, Michael Pullen's got a wonderful phrase. He says, ready, fire, aim. And that applies to our assessments. 
design something that you think will measure the standard that you have, certainly we can provide you some support and guidelines. There's references on our websites, a lot of great work out there from uh, Rick Stiggins and James Popham and Larry Ainsworth. Uh, but don't overcomplicate it. Just get a measure, get it going, and go from there. Uh, for the building and the district data teams, what it means is we have to clearly define whatever practice we're taking a look at and wanting to examine. So if the building data team is measuring how the instructional data teams are doing, they need to use a, a rubric for the process and observe those teams in action to see how well they're doing. Uh, if we're measuring the effectiveness uh, of the instructional practice, then we clearly need to clearly define what that practice is and should look like. Uh, otherwise, we are, are going to be measuring different things and having different perceptions of what's going on. Now, folks, what's absolutely important, uh, several of you just defined how often you meet and for how long, monthly or uh, every other week. Some folks are meeting weekly. Even if you're meeting weekly, ladies and gentlemen, that is not enough time to focus on all of the practices going on in the building or focus on all of the standards for which teachers are responsible. So what's absolutely critical is just like the arrow in the middle of the target here, you're focusing only on what we call priority or power standards or on those practices that you feel will be most effective or have the greatest impact. You know, if you think, if you've read the work of, of Bob Marzano or John Hattie, they both describe literally thousands of strategies that could be used by any teacher in any given day. It's not possible to measure or monitor all of those things. And so we, at a building or a district level, if we're going to measure practice, we have to define what we feel will be a high yield practice and see how well we're doing with that. I've mentioned feedback several times uh, in John Hattie's research. The practice of providing effective feedback, and please note I'm saying effective, but the practice of providing effective feedback has an effect size of 0.7, so that's almost two years of gains. Uh, also in John Hattie's research, uh, if we can create what he describes as assessment-capable learners, kids who know the learning intentions, kids who know where they are in relation to those learning intentions, and kids who know what they need to do to go from where they are to the desired outcome. That has an effect size, folks, of 1.44. Remember, 0.4 is one year's gain. 1.44 is in excess of three years of academic gain by focusing on that practice. Now, that's not just one thing. That takes formative assessment. That takes feedback. That takes clearly defining learning targets or intentions and success criteria. But if we're going to focus on something, that may be a practice that we really try to build. The process. Uh, folks, regardless of where you are, if you're thinking about this from a, a classroom level, a building level, or a district level, the same five steps apply. What I'm going to do here is kind of hit some key points, and for each of the steps, I'll describe what it might look like uh, depending on the level of team that you're paying attention to, or level of team that you're considering. Um, please don't hesitate to send in questions as you uh, listen to uh, what I'm sharing with you here, or as have, you have questions about your practice. Several of you have mentioned that you're already engaged in the data teams process, so please fire those questions off as, as we talk about these steps. First step in the process is getting the data together. Uh, so you see described at the top of the circle or labeled at the top of the circle, charting the data. Now, folks, what's interesting is that we have a tendency as we begin this work to stop there. Uh, we've got to move on. Just collecting the data isn't sufficient. Uh, I saw several of my colleagues, uh, former colleagues from Norfolk Public Schools were, had registered for today. And as we think back to what we did uh, in, in Norfolk Public Schools, I remember that we got pretty good for a long time at being data hunter-gatherers. We had notebooks and filing cabinets of data, and that's kind of where we stopped. Now, if the data that I'm charting at an instructional level are the results of the common formative assessment that I've just administered, uh, I need to take a look at that data uh, 
in a manner that is disaggregated by teacher and by performance level. So knowing that uh, the students in, in my class, 20% uh, of them are proficient or higher, 15% are close, et cetera, on down the chain. Uh, then in Mr. Jones's class and Ms. Smith's class, what are the results? I also need that data for the team as a whole. Where are we in terms of reaching our team goals? At a building level, this data will be both aggregate and disaggregate. What percentage of our students are proficient uh, on uh, the most recent formative assessments or benchmark assessments? Uh, what percentage of our school or of our classrooms are using uh, instructional practices effectively? Uh, might be taking a look at fidelity to the curriculum map. How close are we to that map? Uh, what's the level of rigor in the classroom? Several schools that are engaged in the building data team process look at the level of rigor of questioning. And so what do we see when we visit classrooms? But it's important, folks, at the building level that it also be disaggregated, um, that I see the outliers. Who's doing really well in whatever practice we're, we're describing or monitoring? Who's not doing so well? Uh, which classrooms or individual teachers have uh, significantly better or different formative assessment results, and uh, which classrooms or teachers have significantly lower formative assessment results or benchmark assessment results. Not from the aspect of gotcha. Again, holistic accountability would be then to provide support to those teachers as necessary. Learn from what the successful teachers are doing and support the teachers who aren't being successful. The data collected at a district level in that step would be uh, most likely uh, where are our schools, our students as a whole in third grade in their progress on benchmark assessments, uh, quarterly exams that I might administer, uh, DRA as a district, what percentage of my students is at or above reading level. Uh, also, again, here we want to take a look at outliers. Who are the high, where are the highs, where are the lows? What do we know as we get into step two then? Uh, what do we know about the differences in the practices in those classrooms and buildings? So step two, and, and uh, Olga sent in a comment to me that uh, not all schools have stopped. Some schools have moved beyond the charting of the data, and that's exactly where we need to go. We've got to move from getting those numbers into step two of the process and figuring out what those numbers tell us. Uh, we have to analyze our strengths and our needs and prioritize those needs. At a classroom level, this is identifying the specific gaps that our students have in regard to the standards that we are teaching. At a building level, this is identifying the deficits in adult practice. So what is it that we're doing well? How can we learn from that? What is it with which we are struggling? And what do we do as a leadership team to uh, respond to that? Melissa, thanks for your comments there to everybody. I appreciate that. Um, what's important, though, folks, is that either at a classroom or a building level, we're most likely to uh, identify quite a few needs that we uh, ought to be addressed or that we feel we should address. Absolutely critical that we prioritize. What are those few things that we're going to focus on? Because again, if you think about what's going on in the classroom and, and the students that we serve, their needs are, are very, very uh, diverse. We're going to focus on those things that are going to give us our biggest bang for a buck. We're not saying we ignore the rest, but as a team, what is it we're going to focus our collaborative effort on when determining a shared instructional practice? I still have to differentiate for my students, but we're going to devote our collective wisdom to that biggest area of concern that we see as we analyze the results. Same thing for a building data team. Uh, we're going to prioritize that area of need that we feel we are going to uh, give us the biggest thing for our buck if we close it. Um, yeah, April, and thanks for your response to, to Melissa's question. 100% uh, Melissa agree with April. Focus on one subject at a time until you get good at the process. Pick your predominant area of need, and this is part of the prioritization, and then go from there. Uh, at the district data team level, folks, it's the same thing. We analyze and, and prioritize what we're talking about from Lynn. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely on target. Um, 
prioritize our needs because there's only so many things we're going to be able to do. So down to one or two things that we're going to address. In all three levels, folks, we establish a SMART goal. And those of you that are not familiar with our work probably still have heard of, of the SMART goal. Uh, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and timely. The difference is, folks, that at a building level or a district level, that SMART goal changes from student achievement results on this ongoing basis to uh, goals for adult performance. For example, a building data team might write a SMART goal uh, and decide that they want to increase the percentage of teachers proficient or teams proficient in the data team process. A district data team might decide that they want to increase the percent of building data teams proficient in that process. So we've got a goal for adult actions here. Um, okay, Elizabeth uh, asked a question about uh, is charting data. Who's responsible? Uh, leadership team or the classroom teachers? If not the classroom teachers, do they take ownership for the data? Yeah, it's it's really what we see being most effective, folks, and, and, and several of, of our, uh, our colleagues that are involved in this process, uh, please feel free to, to chime in. But usually what happens, folks, what works best is that we set up some sort of electronic system. Uh, we have some Excel, Microsoft Excel templates that many teams are using. They just post those on their server. Uh, each teacher goes in and records their data quickly. It takes no more than two, three minutes to record the results of those formative assessments. And in the Excel file, they'll, they are automatically tabulated um, and uh, names are sorted and all of that good stuff. So we can move folks from the uh, number of crunching or tabulation straight into the analysis. Uh, so yes, I do suggest that it is the teachers uh, and um, you know not somebody else doing the work for them. Uh, think about electronic systems. I've seen things, folks, as simple as a, a, a chart that's passed around from mailbox to mailbox, paper and pencil. I've seen uh, something that's distributed via email. I've seen everything up to what Lynn just uh, sent in, a, a full and robust data warehouse uh, that some systems have in place. So just think about what it is that's going to get you the information that you need. Uh, and frankly, it, it takes no more than, than two to three minutes to, to tabulate these results. So um, understand the demands on teachers' time and their reluctance to do one more thing. Uh, so we try to keep this as simple as possible. Fourth step in the process, folks, is the selection of strategies. At the instructional data team level, of course, this is instruction. How are we going to teach? Are we going to get kids to classify objects by their attributes? Uh, are we uh, going to uh, involve kids in writing a summary of a passage or making explicit text-to-text -text connections uh, between their guided reading book and other stories that they've read? What's different is between the instructional data team and the building and district data teams is that the instructional teams should only talk about and select instructional practices. Our building data teams and our district data teams have the option to select uh, leadership, specific actions of the leadership in the building or in the district. Uh, and that is actually our preference there. That's what's most effective, that those teams focus on uh, what we as leaders are going to do to support the folks with whom we work. So difference here, instruction versus leadership strategies uh, at the building and district level. And then finally, results indicators. What would it look like if we do this strategy well, be it an instructional practice or a leadership practice? What actions would I see that describe the implementation of this strategy? What evidence would I have that the strategy is doing what it's supposed to do? Uh, and folks, in our templates, we, we set you up for this. So if you're interested in those templates, please don't hesitate to drop us an email, and we'll send those off to you. Um, but these help us do what you see off to the side there. The larger circle is an ongoing monitoring that has to happen. And what's absolutely critical, folks, is that this monitoring is internal and not external. Uh, we've got to uh, get our leaders, our teachers, to monitor the results of their own action if we're going to make real-time mid-course corrections to improve the results that we're getting. So please don't hesitate to, to fire off questions as you go.
So here's what the data might look like for an instructional data team. It's just a simple breakdown of what percentage of our students scored at each level. Again, we would want this disaggregated by teacher uh, so that we can see differences in performance and engage in a professional, con professional conversation uh, about what practices we use that made a difference. Here is an instructional strategy from a, a data team. Uh, in this case, they were working on a, a geometry assessment, geometric figure assessment, and they said that their kids were having difficulty with shapes that had curved corners. Uh, they believed it was because there was a lot of new vocabulary that was involved. And so in response to that vocabulary need, they decided to use a Freyer model uh, in which the kids were asked to define the word using their, their math text and then define it in their own words, uh, describe the important characteristics of uh, that vocabulary word, shape, figure, uh, and you see the specific figures that they were working on there, uh, and give examples and non-examples to go with it. I uh, wanted to do this in small group, minimum of three times a week for 15 minutes. So that's a description of the strategy and uh, what it would look like in the classroom. Here are some data that a building data team might pay attention to or might monitor. A middle school building data team is taking a look at its math department and where are we. So you see each of the teams, you see what goal area or um, standard area they're working on, so ratios and percents for the sixth grade team. Where are they in the assessment cycle? Well, you can see the sixth grade team is just given a pre-assessment and 5% of their kids are proficient uh, on that pre-assessment. Folks, while that looks bad, you actually need to stop and realize, hey, that's a pre-assessment. We haven't taught this yet. That's a celebration that 55% or 5% of our students are actually able to do this before we've even begun teaching. Math, uh, eighth grade team, as we look at a post-assessment here on statistics, only 60% of their students pass that assessment. So a building data team needs to start asking, what support does eighth grade math need? Do we need to get some professional development in there? Do we need to provide some remediation opportunities, uh, things beyond what a classroom teacher can do? Do we need to extend that unit of instruction for them, giving them another week on that so that we know where we're going and have time to do something about it? Um, do we need to help them uh, with model lessons in the classroom? Uh, so an allocation of the resources that we have in the building to support what's going on. Well, that's the outcome, but if you'll remember, folks, I described to you we've got to pay attention to what we do. And so one of the other things that a building data team might take a look at is the degree to which the teachers are implementing the strategies that they described in the data team. So three teachers on this team. Uh, did we see the strategy in place? So in the first teacher's classroom, we made two visits to the classroom during, the, during this week. Uh, and in both cases, we saw the strategy being used. What was the quality of that strategy? Uh, it was a two on the first visit on a scale of one to four and a three. Did I provide him feedback? I did both times. What were this teacher's results? 60%. If you look at teacher two, uh, in both cases here, the uh, teacher one, teacher two, both using the strategy. But teacher do, two was doing a significantly better job with the strategy and had higher gains. Now back to the concept of holistic accountability. You might be looking at teacher three and wondering, uh oh, what do we do? Folks, this isn't a gotcha. Um, the question that a building data team ought to ask is, what support do we need to provide teacher three? Do we need to give them the opportunity to go see teacher two uh, and then reflect on it to get teacher two to come to this classroom and model the practice in place? This isn't a knock on the door and, and body slam teacher three. This is asking the question, what do we need to do to help? That's holistic accountability in place. Here's what a district data team might look at, folks. This is a summary of 100. 26 observations of instructional data teams throughout the district. And you can see step two is showing a lot of red there. The teams weren't very good at it at this point in the year. And so the district, uh, in response to this, offered some professional development in which teachers brought student work samples from assessments that they were administering to the PD and actually learned how to more effectively analyze those work samples against the standards and against the unwrapped standards in order to determine what the specific strengths and needs of their kids were. Up to this point, many of the teams in this observation were only identifying what the kids got right or wrong and not why. Really important piece. 
So they offer two kinds of professional development. They, uh, an actual session, come to uh, a, a training location and learn how to do this. And they also offered on-the-ground coaching and support from their instructional resource folks out to the building. Now, I want to kind of close this section here with does it make a difference? Uh, we were engaged by and have been engaged by several districts in, in what we call an initiative or implementation review in which we look at the quality of certain initiatives and link the, the quality of that implementation to student achievement. Uh, and many districts have asked us to take a look at the quality of professional learning communities and see if there is a relationship. Yeah, James, you're absolutely right. The key question is the why. Folks can't stress it at the instructional data team level, at the building data team level, and at the district data team level. Step two, the absolute key question in the analysis is not the what, it's the why. Why are teachers not doing these actions that they said they were going to do? How do we respond to that? Why are students unable to uh, master this concept or what's getting in the way? Uh, James, right on target there, my friend. Uh, so what you see on the screen here, folks, are, are the results. Um, low, medium, and high implementation. You see professional learning communities had a positive relationship with uh, gains in math performance, but those PLCs that were doing the process at a high level of quality had more than double the gains of those teams that were only doing it kind of well. And so, folks, for those of you that have said that you're really kind of beginning the data teams process, you may be a little frustrated right now because you may not be seeing the results that you want. Stick with it. When you, you see when we go from just starting to do it, we're not doing it very well, or what we would describe as low implementation, we get a little bit better at it, we really don't see uh, the differences in terms of the overall outcomes for students. It's when we go from that good to great data teams or professional learning communities that will see those results. Um, stick with it. Give your teams feedback. I want to talk for a little bit about challenges to implementation and then open it up to questions. First challenge, folks, you've got to develop capacity at all levels. There's no better way to do this than to provide folks direct feedback to what we're, the practice that they're working on. Got to provide time for teachers to meet. And one of the major barriers here is that we ask teachers to meet in this data teams process, but don't provide them with a common planning time. Uh, calibrate, calibrate, calibrate. Make sure everybody understands your expectations. Model, coach, and provide feedback. It just doesn't happen, so be very deliberate. Whatever practice you're working on, uh, be very deliberate in scheduling that modeling, coaching, and, and provision of feedback on that practice. Abdication of responsibility. Uh, many times folks, uh, administrators or district office personnel will say, go do data teams. And then they kind of assume that it's being done. Uh, the most effective schools and systems we see are those where the assistant superintendent uh, is attending data team meetings right along with the building principal to ensure that the process is happening. Uh, but not, again, from the gotcha aspect, but to determine what actions he or she needs to take in order to support it. So please don't just uh, send out a memo and assume it's getting done. And then the final and often biggest barrier is a lack of focus. We try to do too many things at once and therefore are successful at very few of them. Ladies and gentlemen, I uh, at this point, just want to see if there's any lingering questions that you might have about any of the process. Uh, so please feel free to send those questions in via the chat feature. And as you're working on those questions, if you should have uh, questions or issues or like some resources from us, please don't hesitate to give us a call. James asks if this webinar will be available to use with staff. Absolutely, sir. I apologize. I didn't get all of it recorded. The recording picked up on the holistic accountability, but we will make that available to you. It usually takes us a day or two to process it and get it up and posted, but you'll receive a link afterwards. Um, if you'd like any other resources like the Excel templates that I mentioned, please just drop me a line at the email address that you see there. Uh, 
Uh, if you have questions about where you are in the process, many of you, uh, such as Melissa said, you've been trying to do a couple of different things and, and are a little bit stuck. My email address is tflock at leadandlearn.com. Uh, also, folks, please go check out our website, uh, www.leadandlearn.com. We have a probably about 40 pre-recorded webinars that are free for you to download, or you can give me a call at the cell phone, the mobile number that you see there on screen. Ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate your attention today. I will uh, hang on the line for a little bit to see if there are any other questions. Uh, otherwise, uh, have a wonderful rest of your day.